So thank you guys for coming to the 12th annual San Luis Valley Seed Exchange in Moffett, Colorado. Um, this year we are donating all of our day of donations to the Rio Grande Farm Parks Rising Stewards Program, which is uh, sort of an internship style program that is gonna take um, some area high school students throughout the summer and teach them how to farm and give them the resources to do that down at the farm park. And if you um, want to know more about that, they have a booth in the backyard up by the uh, event center. And um, so please, uh, there's a donation jar in the back. Leave a donation here or up at the information booth in the front. And um, yeah, thank you guys for being here. Our next presenter is Jeff, who loves anything who has to do with soil, compost, growing plants and vegetables, and regenerative farming. He and his wife, Lynn, have worked from scratch to develop a sustainable food shed homestead in California, Hawaii, and now in Paonia, Colorado. So I'm going to turn it over to Jeff and let him uh, tell you what he knows about homesteads. Thank you. Thank you, guys, for sure. So grateful that you are here when it's so nice outside joining, <laughs> joining us. It's uh, yeah, quite an honor. I do have a confession. This is the first PowerPoint I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go running out the door. You got it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think we'll have a good time for sure. And uh, I do know I have too many slides. So you know, if I talk fast, just remind me, and we'll just kind of flip, flip through some areas as fast as we can. So anyway, this, uh, this is about homesteads, and I'm sure every one of you has a different idea in your mind of what a homestead looks like, okay? <laughs> so just to get us on the same page, I want to suggest a definition, and that is homesteads grow food. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's pretty inclusive, you know? If you've got a basil plant in the window, you're in. <laughs> okay? So it's my hope that I can inspire you to create a homestead, to grow food at home. And if you're already doing that, maybe you can add another bed or perhaps put some flowers or even you know, native plants, something like that. It's all good. So maybe we're going to do that. We're going to take a little picture trip through these three homesteads that were just mentioned that Lynn and I have put together since we've been together and uh, do it that way. So little. So I just want to really quickly talk about the importance of food choices. The pandemic has really brought it out, you know, and I'm sure most of us in this, in this room probably choose organic and natural whenever we can, okay? So where do we source that? Well, grocery stores, more and more have organics, bless their hearts. The problem is you don't know how they're grown, when they were picked, how long they've been stored. Natural food stores, same, same way in a way. Better selection. I love them in the wintertime. We have all that stuff in California and uh, Mexico. But you have no idea, again, how they were grown, uh, you know, when they were picked. And it's important when things were picked and how long they were stored. The third thing, thank you, is farmer's markets. I don't know if you're lucky enough to have one around here. You know, they are a blessing. There's no doubt about it. Fresh local food in season, great. Hopefully organic. We got some here. Yeah, right on. Okay, the next one is the local eco-farmers. If you have a local eco-farmer that you know and trust, and buy from them, that's just stellar. That's one of the best things. Buy local, right? <laughs> right. So the last one is my four stars, okay? It's my belief that you put your heart into it. The very best food that you can serve your family is the food that you grow in your garden, with your hands, and with your intention, okay? So I'd like to focus a minute on that word intention. The scientists are telling us we live in a quantum world. And a quantum world says, suggests that everything is energy, vibration, and frequency. So think about that when you're in the garden. Okay? So, <coughs> got my slide back here. <laughs> so, anyway, oh, yeah, I think I need this next slide. Sorry, right. I'm doing my slides. So, I would like to suggest that just perhaps the high nutritional quality that we are talking about in this gathering has as much to do with our positive thoughts and our intentions as any of the physical amendments and eco-methods that we practice. Now that's a big gulp for most of us, for sure. But you know something? 
the effects of human anger and angst and all that stuff brought in the garden can be and has been measured scientifically. And you know something? The plants are not happy. So here's the secret. You cruise into your garden to check out the plants, and guess what? They're checking you out. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a little suggestion for this, you know, and that's a chair in every garden. All us uh, homesteaders never take a break anyway. We need to take more breaks. So sit in that chair, take some deep breaths, chill out, take in the beauty and the magic of the garden, you know. It will raise your vibration, I assure you. And your vibration will raise the garden vibration. And if you're lucky, together you'll mo raise the whole neighborhood vibration, you know? It's my belief that the garden is a portal for uh, peace and abundance. You just got to open that door or sit in that chair, okay? So we're going to go to California. In 1994, yeah, we're old, uh, we were living in Oakland. And a friend of Lynn's approached her and asked her if she'd like to consider living on her 40-acre back of her 40-acre piece of property in the hills above Santa Rosa. Well, that sounded pretty interesting. So we drove up there, and it was love at first sight. This is oak savanna. That's what I call oak savanna. You know, fields of grass and oak trees, bay, laurel, all that stuff. It is just beautiful. So, so, so we said, yeah, this is really good. But there's one thing we had to check on first. You know, like, like all, we do that whole permaculture design thing. So what would be the most important thing that you would look for? Water. Water. Ah, everybody knows that. Water. So this place just happened to have a great well. You know, it's been cons consistent for years. It was up on that hill. So, you know, all the water went down. We had that head, that pressure. And we didn't need pumps or anything like that. So anyway, it was a go. We went home. Oakland uh, arranged all the details and then started coming up. Okay, every uh, <coughs> every week, every well, every bit of time we could get. So there was an old farmhouse down there, and the first thing we did we tore that down because it was a mess, and we recycled a ton of material. We were building our dream house, and by the time we were done, we had recycled almost 60 percent. Windows, the whole thing. So we were we we're. <laughs> We were really, yeah, we were really proud of that. So anyway, so next slide. So you know homesteaders, they are out scavenging and recycling everything, right? So California, Northern California was great. A lot of redwood back then. It was just wonderful. But the other things you want to get ready for when you build things are, are what was available out there for free was uh, manure and straw. And you could buy compost and worm, worm compost and all that kind of stuff. So that part of California really had a lot of access to things to work with. So. Oh, sorry. Okay. So anyway, this is the site, right? And it's a brand new house. So you can see around the house, there's a lot of room. And in permaculture, you know, we have zones. We go one to five, and the first zone is the one you go to the most. So you would think you'd kind of put that kitchen garden or something near the house. Well, it turned out it was really hard soil for whatever. Probably a lot of machinery compacted it. And the second thing was, it was, it was occupied. <laughs> Isn't he beautiful? This is a California rattlesnake. They usually uh, look more like gopher snakes. But anyway, he had a lot of friends. There was a whole den right behind our house in a rock wall. Wow. I don't know your relationship with rattlesnakes, but <laughs> ours wasn't real strong. But anyway, you know, the options were go to war, get out of there, or coexist. So we, we chose coexistence, and uh, we made an agreement with the rattlesnake. Essentially, it was real simple. We would be careful, and they would rattle. <laughs> yeah, and that worked. That actually worked the whole time we were there. Okay, yeah. So anyway, so this is looking at the house across at the bottom of that hill. You just looked at it. You can see all that redwood we, we salvaged and put together and gates and everything. So anyway, that was a great place to go. It was actually zone two, but it was close enough. Topsoil runs down the bottom of the hill. It was really nice down there. It was kind of flat. So we just went for it. So, so anyway, we built that, and by on, we put that fence in the front, but all around the side, we had to you know, buy posts and wire because we have those ever-present, ever-hungry, four-legged deer guys you know, who specialize in eating deer-resistant plants. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and Liz mentioned other things that we'll get into. So, <laughs> okay, no, 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 no. Yep. 
So anyway, so here's the garden. I want to stay here a while in this, this uh, s picture right here. There's three things I really want you to carry away from this particular site. So one thing is we had a lot of land, okay? You don't use it. Most people don't have a lot of land. We had a subdivision, a couple of land guys, just a little bit of this. So one of the best way to extend your harvest or get more land, more out of a small bed? Yeah, go up, essentially. Trellis, okay? Trellising is just the best. A lot of plants love it. You know, it, it keeps things in the air and prevents diseases and stuff like that. Makes it easy to harvest and all that stuff. The other thing we love, it's, it's an artwork. You know, you can have more fun with trellis. I mean, you've seen every kind of trellis in the world, and some of them are really beautiful. So. Okay, the second thing, which you won't see on this slide, but was greatly affected by it, there was a farmer up in our area, Bob Kennard. He was a legend up there, and he's an unusual guy. He was the first farmer t that uh, Alice Waters from Chez Panisse hired to, to uh, grow the food. You know, uh, this was one of the first farmed food operations in the country, and, and Chez Panisse was in Berkeley. So anyway, he picked Bob because Bob's food was not only so health, uh, healthy, but it was, you know, had a great taste, okay? Really unusual. So we had to go see what was up there. So we, had, we arranged it with Bob, and we went over to his site. And when you come into Bob's place, it's actually vibrant. But what a mess. We're going, like, oh, you know? <laughs> well, Bob was known for loving the weeds, loving the animals, loving the gophers, loving all the things that farmers go nuts over, right? So his whole motto was 50% for me, 50% for nature. Okay, so anyway, we cruised in, met him in his living room, and I noticed the window was open, no screen on it. And sure enough, in flew a barn swallow. We had a barn swallow nest up there, right in the corner on clay. I was like, we're going to like this guy, right? <laughs> so Next, we went out to his irrigation place. He had this huge redwood tank there, you know, that, that they have so much in Northern California. Then he had a low stock tank and a couple of other little stock tanks draining into it. So he had weeds and herbs and all kinds of things, you know, melting down and going into the stock tanks. And then, he, I don't know where he got it, but he had all kinds of milk and stuff, and it was wine country, so he had all these wines his friends had given him that weren't, you know, didn't cut the mustard. So what was this? This was an inoculation tank, essentially. It was just amazing, and I think it was the reason this farm was so vibrant. So, so all that stuff, every time the water went on, it was all mixed up, it inoculated his farm. Constant inoculation, adding microbes and all that, the things that really make things healthy. So great thing to think about. You can go to the stores. You can probably go right to the, the little expo back there and buy microbials. But this is a nice way to do it free and just, you know, an excellent thing. I'm sorry? Everything you can get a hold of, any kind of organics. Yeah. Okay. Can, if you can only hold your questions till the end, because I'm going to, we'll definitely try and make it. But. So uh, the second thing Bob offered to us, I absolutely love and use all the time, is rock dust. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but pretty popular these days. Bob had tons of it around. He even foliar fed his plants rock dust. I mean, just unbelievable. And uh, he had azomite, which is the most popular. It comes from Utah, but there's all kinds of other varieties. We use azomite, and then we you know, have basalt ones, and then Canada glacial melt. But anyway, it's a remineralizer. It does it at a real small level, has lots of micronutrients. It works all the time. It's just a great thing to put on. And I, I mix it on my soil mixes. I just put it in the garden all the time. A wonderful thing. So that was a, not yet. <laughs> so that was the first great guy in our garden as far as influence. The second one was somebody we brought up in the Bay Area, and that's John Jevons. I don't know if you ever heard of him, but he's responsible for something called Grow Biointensive. He's a legend where we c come from. He, He's been uh, doing this gardening work for 40 years, and he is absolutely the master of growing a lot of stuff in a small space. Okay, so he has. This is his. This is the fifth edition of his books. I think there's eight editions or something like that. But this says it all: how to grow more vegetables than you ever thought on less land than you can imagine. <laughs> and this is for real, you know. And he not only does. Because I'm thinking, you know, you look at that bed there, that raised bed. That's about what a lot of people have, and that's a lot of the beds that he's, he has. He can just grow a ton of food in that. He's the one who made double digging popular, okay? I double digged all those gardens. I had a lot of energy in those days. But uh, double digging allows, you know, to loosen the soil, get amendments down further so the roots can go down further. So he can put, get more plants into his beds. He, uh, he, has, he just has all of these facts and figures, how to plant the beds to get the most numbers in there, and... Uh, 
highest nutrition. He uses like a fraction of the water. It's an amazing thing. If I had to, you know, if I had to do one book, I was looking at Linda and I books. We have about 40 or 50 garden and farm books. That would be the book I would pick. It just covers absolutely everything and all the facts and figures for how many people can be fed from a garden and a bed and all that. So he does it really consciously. I'm sorry? John Jevons. Yeah. Grow Biointensive. Okay, so the result of all these good things was the next picture, and we had talked about that before. The best food you can get comes from your farm. Okay, so you combine that with the best that nature has to offer. Next, chanterelles here. You know, we had mushrooms just growing right outside the door. I know a lot of you guys here go up in the, in the woods at mushroom time and get it. So anyway, you put those together, and those are meals to die for. <laughs> I mean, this makes for happy campers. Okay, next. So anyway, we just kept at it. You know, we loved where we were. It seemed like anything you plant was beautiful. It, California, that part of California was just outrageous. And uh, so they had Linda, their magic, plenty of herbs, lots of herbs and things like that there. You know? Okay, hold it. So you can go, our, our realization was you can grow anything in that part of California if you have water, right? Well, guess what? In six and a half years, the wealth failed. You know, this our dream, <laughs> it just failed. So we were hoping it was temporary, but what happened is the guy next door was growing grapes. He decided to increase his vineyard. He went up and drilled a well right across from ours. It was just amazing. So we both tapped in the same place. There was not enough water to support us and the people who owned the land who were in the front and had their own vineyard and big water needs. So, wow. So we panicked. We, uh, we were running a community garden downtown, and we started hauling water up. And boy, that gets old. So that didn't work. And finally, we realized this is not going to work. You know, we were going to have to leave this, our dream here. So we went up and down uh, the California coast, and then we went up into Oregon. No luck for land. We went to uh, uh, the state of Vermont, where I always wanted to be, and that didn't work out, which means it wasn't meant to be, of course. And then we were pretty stressed, and we needed a vacation. So we grabbed two weeks and flew off to the big island in Hawaii. All right? So we went to, we were in the, we were cruising around the big island. Of course, I was busy looking at the palm trees, the surfers. Meanwhile, Lynn was getting somebody whispering in her ear, and it turned out to be Pele, the, the volcanic goddess. And that government, they do that to a lot of women over here. Anyway, she just announced to me, this is where we were going to be. So this is where we ended up. So with the help of a whole lot of friends, we uh, managed to pull out of Santa Rosa, left all that stuff just as it was, and, and went to Pahoa. So we, uh, in that two weeks that we were there, before we went back, we actually jammed. We found a realtor. We found a, this home. You know, it was in the middle of nowhere. The realtor thought we were crazy, but, you know, it didn't cost a lot because it's down in that Puna district. And so we grabbed it. And that was about all we knew of it. So we went back, you know, went back and got all our stuff together, of course. And so, go to the next picture, I'm sorry. So this is, this is what the location. So, you <laughs> know, pretty nice place. We were not on the water, but we were across the street from the water. So this is the east side of the island, right? This is where the rain and the, and the trades come in. So we didn't worry about water this time. We just thought, oh, we're golden, right? So, so we just started to explore. Next picture. So what was this place we bought, you know? So we went up there, and this, it was jungle. But it wasn't the original wonderful um, Hawaiian jungle. This was all cleared long ago. The birds were going around. This is all evasive, overgrowth, mostly guava and stuff like that. This is chop and drop country, is what they call it. And uh, this is a two and a half acre uh, spaghetti lot. It's only 125 feet wide, but it's 1,000 feet long. Very common little lots up there. The other thing. This thing didn't have soil. It was all new lava. I mean, it wasn't even on the soil map. It had some things that looked like soil you know, here and there, but like, <laughs> whoa, <laughs> you know, fire and more. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, and, the la and the other thing, of course, it was off grid. Almost everything down there was off grid. Uh, this is, you know, we had compost toilets. And we did the humanure system. That's the name of a book you might check out if you ever had that situation. That's a water tank. Every roof we had had water tanks on it because that's the way we had, you know, we got our water. 
you know, th this, this was part of a cottage that had one tank. The main barn had something like four or five tanks. These are 2,500 gallon tanks. It looked like an Exxon refinery, <laughs> but we needed that water, you know. But, uh, so the other thing, of course, solar. You know, when we came to Hawaii, solar was so expensive. By the time we left, 16 years later, it <laughs> the panels at least were really cheap. No grid tie here, all batteries. It really got hard to deal with in a way. So, so anyway, we, you know, should we sell this place? No, what? No. Anyway, we went up and we started clearing. We we're just going to make the best of it. So, okay. So anyway, three, year, three years in or so, you know, still having these soil problems. I was busy trying to get soil together, but Lynn went to a class on aquaponics. I don't know if any of you have done aquaponics before. It became big, you know, in Hawaii, and uh, it's it's crazy. Anybody ever do it? Okay, yeah, this isn't the best part of the world because it can't freeze, of course. It's got to be in a greenhouse or something, but... Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. Super productive. I mean, this is a big, you know, well, it's a medium-sized system, but super productive. You can grow all kinds of things. You know, people, like I think Lynn alluded to this in her talk, you like to grow your things you're familiar with when you go to a new place, and it doesn't always work in Hawaii, of course. And, but we can grow a lot of that stuff in this system here. But the problem with this system, it was fish-based. That means you feed the fish, they poop, that goes through the system, fertilizes everything, goes down, you've got to pump it up again. Had all these things that could go wrong, you know? The pump could go wrong, it could have a leak, it could have build up of stuff, you know, did you get enough fish food, uh, were the fish pooping or not, I mean, all these things, and uh, we actually went away once, the power went off, and we lost all the fish, I mean, big tilapia and catfish type fish, so, it was a pain in the butt, in a way, it was wonderful, and a pain in the butt at the same time, so, I like my things growing in the ground, I like those earth energies, so I was busy making soil, now that sounds pretty godlike, making soil, but, you know, I was essentially I was buying subsoils from the Hamakua Coast, where the sugar cane used to be, most of the topsoil was long gone and here, you know, from the that industry. And I was getting cinder from the cinder cone. So we mixed that together and that was the basis of our soil. And then I tried to add everything else that I could think of that was good. You know, the rock dust, the humates, all kinds of things. But the w one thing I want to show you next is became really important. And that was biochar. I don't know, you probably all heard of biochar or not, but you know, it comes from the tropics. They found these rich areas and really poor soils that were black and I wonder what was going on. This is, it's essentially agricultural charcoal, okay? And uh, so it's been brought up here, it's been really studied. We used it a lot in Hawaii, we had wonderful results. So what's it all about? It uh, essentially does three things. It, it holds water, it holds nutrients, and it holds soil microbiology, okay? All those things are just great, and the tropics are anywhere. I noticed the stuff was sold, uh, you know, where we are now in Colorado. You can get it all over the place. There's two things you have to be careful of. Number one, it's alkaline, and you know we're an alkaline part of the world for sure. And number two, you have to inoculate it first. It's kind of like a hotel for all those things, right? And if the hotel's not filled up when you put it in the ground, it's going to take all the stuff that's in the ground and fill it up. So essentially, I throw it in my compost piles, or I, uh, <coughs> you know, I make teas and all that, and soak it and all that. So it's just, it's a wonderful thing to, to do. So. Okay, oh, I'm going to hurry, okay. So here's the way our land was, you know, forget about zones one, two, three, we just went down here, and I st we started clearing, and uh, this went right down the center, so we had all of our things off it, and we started making all our beds with the soil I had. I have a confession, you know, it was not a rototill or anything like that, but we, we broke up the blue rock on this land. It was a D9. <laughs> Ever walk around a D9? <laughs> Look up at the driver, it's just unbelievable. Puna was a graveyard for D9s. They just were so beat up with these, this blue rock. It was so hard. That big tooth thing in the back would go and it would just go, you know, scratching through it. But they just worried it to death. They kept going over it, you know, crushing it with their tracks and all that stuff. And finally, got it down to a place where we could kind of finish it off, put the dirt that we made, the soil that we made in there, and grow things. So, okay? So this is where you can start to see the bed. This is a monkey pod tree, one of the few trees we had that was left that was really nice. And uh, so that was uh, actually forest gardening. That's a guild under there, mostly herbs and spices and all that. So this is our main garden. You can see the trellising there. That's a zola growing in those pots. That was for the, uh, the ducks and the, and the chickens. We had them both there. 
We love them. A lot of people where we live now are getting chickens. Just beware. They're they obvious. They are living animals. They need a lot of attention and all that stuff. Nice to have the fresh eggs. But, and the other thing is they're loud. You know? Not even without a rooster. They're loud, especially when they're laying eggs. And, and the ducks are always yakking. That's a whole other <laughs> thing. So, <laughs> so what did grow there? Trees. Once we broke up, it, to the trees just somehow magically got down in there. And I don't know if it was Iowa loam or what was underneath, but the roots went down and we planted tons of trees. So all down this road, you can see the, the well, I don't see it, white tannins or birches, all kinds of tropical trees. Um, and they, they just did great. So, And this is bamboo, by the way, another thing that grew beautifully there. So anyway, the next thing I want to tell you about was something that just came in Hawaii about halfway through for us, and that was Korean natural farming. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. Obviously, it came from Korea, and the best farmers, the best farms over there are kind of like the biodynamic farms in, in Europe do this system. It's a self-contained system. It's all about IMOs, indigenous microorganisms. You build them up with ferments, with brown sugar, keep building them up. And you do with wheat bran or rice, rice bran. You make something called bokashis. There's some for sale over there, believe it or not. And then you, it's a soil inoculation. You're just inoculating the soil like crazy. And it's just amazing. They do all the other practices, the cover crops and all the good things too. But it's really something interesting to read about. And I did put these couple of books on later. This is, this is one of the, this is the, the guy who created it, this is his son who did this. And it's just a great read. A lot of things you think are important, like compost and all that, they don't use them. They make anaerobic teas. It kinda, you realize there's a lot of ways to grow in this world, for sure. A lot of ways. So anyway, we started growing so much food here that we went from a homestead to a small farm. <laughs> it just happened. So Beach Road Farm, that was our name. We were in the Beach Road. So, so I just threw the picture in of our nursery. I want to remind you, no matter how big or small you are, whenever you plant things, plant a few extra. Not only if something dies in your garden, but you know we're a growing community. It's so nice to gift and to trade within, in a, you know, it just it's really special. It's such a wonderful thing to do. So this is vanilla. F that's not vanilla flower. That's a spoon. But this is vanilla vine. It's an orchid. And that's vanilla. This was our best crop, our highest cash crop. Our buyer said that we had some of the best vanilla, in, you know, in the whole state. It was just incredible. I wonder why vanilla costs so much. Wow. <laughs> had no pollinators, you got hand pollinated. It's endless processing and all that. Personally, we took in a lot of money. I don't think we made any money, <laughs> but I did one of those things. <laughs> Next slide. Okay, this is our book for Hillary with cacao. Cacao, chocolate became, Hawaiian chocolate became more pop popular as we were leaving. Anybody know David Avocado Wolf? He's one of the ones who made it popular. Never seen a guy with such delight for us in my life. But, but anyway, we sold a lot of cacao. Next. So we had a fruit stand. I always wanted a fruit stand. So, yeah, <laughs> this was an interesting one. It was an honor stand. You've got to be in a good spiritual place to have an honor fruit stand. Things do evaporate occasionally. <laughs> in Hawaii. So, anyway, we had a great time here. We had, uh, you know, we had a lot of tours go through. We did a lot of extra work to keep it real clean and neat. Uh, Lynn did her seed work all over the state. We had. Uh, permaculture tours, young people coming in, and lots of other things. And we constantly were fighting GMOs. Hawaii is the center of GMOs. It was a nightmare, and that's a whole rabbit hole we're not going to get into. But you can see that GMO-free zone sign. We made those because I lived in them up there. They've been, those have been in marches all over the world. So anyway, uh, we planted too much. So common. It was just too much work. You, you know, we couldn't get to that ocean. It was so close. And we got out of it. <laughs> we got out. And something called a little fire ant was <laughs> going over the island. Hawaii is just, you know, that's a, another story. But it was closing in on us. You had to use toxics. We weren't into it. So we were looking for a way out. A friend moved from Hawaii to Colorado. She and Lynn on, went on, on a piece of land. And uh, then she bought a house and invited us over. So it took us a year to sell it, but we cleared out. So we ended up in Paonia. Yay, we're neighbors. Yeah. So this is a... Uh, <coughs> This is the land we bought, three and a half acres, and uh, has this shelf, goes up the hill, over, and then up again a little bit, all the way up to Pan American. Does it have water? The sewer ditch goes right, right across our land. It's incredible. And there's uh, the community waters over here, so we hired an excavator to bring the water down. We again have gravity-fed water. So wonderful. And we have this. 
we have a leak. We have a seep in our ditch. This is really common, you know? And uh, it was raising hell with the neighbor, the senior center apartments next door. They didn't want it. It was, you know, going to the parking lot and all. So we channeled it over with pipes. And then we had this beautiful little pond as long as the ditch is flowing, okay? Ditch was last year with the drought, they were supposed to cut it off in June or July, went until November. So that's what it's like. Okay, next. So while I was busy tearing up Donna's backyard and redoing all her gardens, Lynn was over at the land, really connecting with it. And and doing her love. So this is a habitat strip she put in. This is 200 feet long. It's incredible. <laughs> 240. All right? A huge amount of work. We had to put down weed cloth first, but she just cranked at it while I was kept over at Donna's. And so next, next. And uh, yeah, so this is midway. And then next, this is it flowering. It's just beautiful. This is dangerous stuff. If you want to meet all your neighbors, you want to have everybody stop, you want to. You know, it's almost impossible to get any work done. Everybody in town knew about this strip. <laughs> it was just a drawing card. And of course, it was always full of butterflies and bees and birds and all that. It was just wonderful and, uh, yeah, hard thing to get a hold of. So this strip back here, next picture, was covered. This is uh, a row of nine king cherries. You know, we had to put that in a deer fence. The deer there are as hungry as they were in uh, California, of course. Nine king cherries are food for both us and the birds. We're going to leave it for the birds. We're also hoping they'll grow up and give us a little privacy. That's the only tree, that only tree, the only tree in this whole big front field of ours. Except okay. for the, along the seat. Except along the seat. So anyway, uh, we, we love the neighborhood enough, we love the land enough, we decided to build there. You know, permaculturally, the best place is on the shelf back there. The, uh, it faces south, it's just great. So uh, Lynn designed the house, and uh, it's a hybrid. It's a half straw bale, half regular construction, but with super insulation. Now, I don't know if you know this guy. Anybody here from Crestone? That's Paul Cop Copana. I think that's the way you pronounce it. Paul Copana. Yeah. He's built a bunch of these in Crestone. Anyway, he's wonderful. The house is great. He just did a sweet job. We did a lot of the work. He allowed us to do that, so we kept the price down. Go ahead. This is it finished. Go ahead. So, this is what you need to do. You've got to get a stash of good stuff to work with your land. So this is what we did here. Now here you can buy compost and all that kind of stuff for sure. But manure is pretty much free. And leaves. Boy, I haven't been around leaves for such a long time. You go and pay under town park and rake leaves up. And boy, they are just great, yeah? So <laughs> make great compost and all that. All these wires are compost that I am making, my compost bins. And, uh, you know, our soil leaves. Something to be desired for sure. Next. Fertility, worms, right? We use worms a lot in Hawaii, but here, I just recommend, especially if you're new, what's the best bang for the buck is having a little worm bin in your house and start getting the worm thing going. You know, a little bit of vermicompost, they call it, the worm casings in your, uh, as you plant things, is just great. And you just need about a quart to make uh, a five-gallon bucket of worm tea, which is another wonderful thing for your garden. And you can make it with a five-gallon bucket and a little aquarium sprayer and all that. So that's an aerobic tea, of course. This is along the, uh, where we put the irrigation along the driveway. We put in a garden net first year. Why there? Because that ground was so damn hard. I couldn't, we couldn't get anything done except where he had dug up to put the pipes in, right? So anyway, we got away with the garden for two years. I have no idea why the deer, deer allowed us to do that, but they did. <laughs> and uh, now we're taking it all out and putting in you know, natives and pollinators, things and all that. So this is the front yard. You probably all run into this construction. Everything's packed. The soil's horrible, you know. Da, 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 da. So, so essentially, I got a rototiller. Rototillers are bad news normally, you know. They destroy s the soil structure, and they destroy the mycorrhizal relationships, the fungal relationships in the soil. But when you're first starting, and you don't have to worry about those things, they're indispensable. I tried picking this stuff. I can't get anywhere. So I rented this big rototiller. We rototilled it a couple of times, smoothed it out, took all those shredded leaves and, you know, compost we had bought and things like that and, and some amendments, put in there, rototilled it in again, smoothed it off, and then we worked from there. So the next one, this is it in the next stage, and, you know, and that's all uh, white, clover. white clover, bunker grass, thank you. And all Lynn's magic with the flowers and things like that. So quite a change. By the way, we put in a deer fence, you can see, because we had to get something around there. So and that so this is another picture close up. Notice that guy on the flower? Yeah, you got him around here? That's a monarch, right? 
we're part of that thousands of people all over the country, plenty of monarchs, Mil milkweed, you know. I actually have a bottle of it back there if anybody wants to get it. Just remember, you have to cold stratify it, and it takes two years to get to the flowers. But, you know, they almost tanked two years ago. They're starting to come back a little bit, and I think it's because everybody's helping out, you know. Classic habitat loose and use and too much ground up and all that stuff. Oh, and bir birds, too. So, I don't, don't, I don't know what that was. <laughs> Next picture. Okay. This is a, this is, we did the same thing on the side of the house. Finally, we have a kitchen garden. I mean, this is zone one. We could actually go right out of the mudroom and there was a garden, right? So, same horrible soil. Had to uh, rototill it a few times, put all that stuff in, amended it. And, and we put a cover crop in. Cover crops are not like they used to be. You know, you used to put one or two things in, you know, some whatever was appropriate, rye or buckwheat or something. Now it's like 10, 15, sometimes even 20 varieties. Why is that? Because you want all those roots down in the ground for the microbiology. Every root is putting about half of its plant sugars down in there to feed that microbiology. So that's really key to health. Having mulch on top is nice, but that does not feed the microbiology. So it's a good thing to know. So anyway, that worked out great. We had the water that we could use to get it, keep it going all season. So the okay. So the next, so next year, I rototilled this in. We laid out the garden. I laid out the garden bed, and uh, you know, we rototilled again. Laid out the garden bed. Then I could take all the stuff from the path and put it up into the beds. And, uh, and the soil actually is looking pretty good, so I amended it and, and all that kind of stuff. The thing I want to say about this is the next book I wanted to show you. And you ever heard of Steve Solomon? He founded Territorial Seeds years ago. And he was a big organic gardener for years and did nothing but, you know, basically add compost like the old Rodale method. And, you know, he was having ill health. He couldn't figure it out. And it turns out that his soil was not balanced uh, minerally. So he'd be, you know, so... He finally got it done, and he wrote this book called The Intelligent Gardener. And I think everybody should check it out because it talks about soil tests and why you need them and how important it is because you need proper mineralogy to get proper biology. They go together. You almost can't do one without the other. So it's really worth investing in a soil test. I go to Ward Labs. They're $20, and, you know, you can add good add-ons, but they're really basic. Ward Laboratories. That's just one of many places. He likes Logan. He has Logan in the book. Okay, so anyway, so we got that. So we got, we did that. I put a lot of amendments on it, and I hope I don't have to do that again for a couple of years. My newest soil test came back. I just need the nit you know, nitrogen, which I have to do every year, pretty much. Okay, another thing you want to notice is the shade cloth. We can't believe it. We came from Hawaii. This sun is brutal. <laughs> you know, we're at 5,600 feet here, and it's just like, wow. Everything does better under there. Even the tomatoes and the peppers. I mean, it's, it's really quite amazing. Yeah, it's quite all of it. So, next picture, please. Oh, thank you. Oh, boy. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so this is the garden. And, uh, and the thing I want to point out to you this time, the chairs, right? For <laughs> and, and no, no, no. For the water tank. You know, you've seen those, all those people have these uh, barrels, you know, that, on the down, the down south. Get, a, get a one of these open tanks. You just dip. It's so much easier. And if you have city water, you can fill it up and you let the chlorine dissipate. And if you get mosquitoes, just throw some BT in there. This is really great. Next. Any of you guys that are uh, permaculture guys, you know this, this is a swale. We put this swale in behind the house. A little steep for this hill, but it still works. Go ahead. You know what a swale does? The water comes down, gets a teardrop of water underneath there. So it's just right for planting something. Trees uh, are the best for this. So here's, I'm working, working on that. The swale's right there, of course. And this is going to be all trees in here. Hopefully they can get their roots down into that thing. And uh, right, now, right now I'm putting a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, wood chips we got in. Trees are a fungal relationship. They like that. So if you have enough water to melt them down over the summer rather than just petrify like they do in so much of western Colorado, it's a great deal. Go ahead. Season extenders. Boy, you can't beat the old cold frames. This is a really fancy one. It costs over 200 bucks at Costco, but look at it. It's polycarbonate. You can move it anywhere, and it's got that opener. You know, all the other cold frames are just like everybody else. You just, you know, get windows where you can find them and build a frame around them. 
you have to remember to open and close them. Otherwise, you're going to burn everything up or you're going to freeze everything. So, you know, it's just really important. The other season extender is, is this, of course. These are poly tunnels and cloths. We get that. You can buy this at all kind of grades for all kind of temperatures. The thicker it is, the better it is for temperature, but the less sun that comes in, okay? You'll notice our brush pile, by the way. If you've got the room, the animals will love it, the birds and all that. Okay, next. So, we just have a couple shots of our neighbors, okay? The, the uh, little homestead gardens our neighbors have. You don't need much room to grow a lot of food for your family. It's just amazing. Next. This is a neighbor down the street. She got this beautiful little garden. She plants it every year, but her deer fence isn't high enough. The deer just jump over and chow down. It's just three years, you know. Who knows? What's that? You know, that's a good question. Uh, probably about seven feet, I would guess. I've seen them on or five foot fences, and I've seen them jump over and then a rows of seven foot fences. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And the other thing we found, like with the mansion here, is if we put the fence close, they, they, they aren't going to jump in. Okay. Next. This bed was across the street. You often find this. An older neighbor just didn't want to do it anymore, right? So when we were first there, there were these four beautiful beds stood in there. And so I took a soil test, I mended them up. And I did the John Jevons thing with greens. And I swear, I could have fed our whole neighborhood from that bed. It was just amazing. I didn't double dig it, but, <laughs> but it's like, yeah, that's what you can do. Okay, next. So this is the other corner of our place. You can see the flowers are really coming in. Another dipping tank. We love the birds. We are our official habitat hero Audubon thing, you know. In fact, we're planning on becoming a bird sanctuary. That's our, our goal. Next one. Putting up the birdhouses all over the place. So anyway, this is uh, this is kind of what it's all about. Thank you for joining joining us. Uh, I really do want to just remember to keep your vibration high and positive, because that'll transfer to the garden. There's just no doubt about it. Okay, that, uh, that's it. <laughs>